Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. This is webinar number 56 and we're talking about the Surefoot Equine Stability Program and the Surefoot Pads. Today I want to help people start to see a little more what I see when I place a horse's foot on a pad and the kind of things that I'm looking for. Um, sometimes it's uh, not so evident and other times it's so obvious you can't miss it. But I thought it'd be really interesting to just kind of go through and look at some different pictures and have a discussion about the changes that we see. I have one horse in particular that was from New Zealand that was really dramatic. Um, and so um, it just gives you an idea of some of the things that can change or that you might notice or that are good to observe when you're using Surefoot with your horse. Um, when we've, oh, hi, Janet. <laughs> it's really fun to see who's coming in. Um, you know, the, the thing about Surefoot that's so fascinating is that it works on so many different levels. And I think that maybe if you've been watching any of the webinars that I've been doing, one of the things that you start to gather from all of this is that Surefoot is affecting the whole horse. And so there's a lot of different systems in that horse that we're hitting. Um, in the nervous system, there's a release of neurochemicals um, evidenced by the change in um, tension level. We see horses going from anxious to calm, from nervous to relaxed. We might even see them get a little bit um, sleepy looking. The eye really softens, the neck lowers, there's breathing changes. So we know that we're affecting that nervous system at a really profound level. Uh, using Surefoot, um, just by looking at the horse, just by seeing the changes, the visible changes in their body. Um, but we also know we're affecting their posture and that we're working on proprioceptors. So proprioceptors are the receptors that tell you where you are in space. It's how you can, you know, reach behind you without looking and grab something and, you know, because you know where your body is. It's also the sense that lets us walk around in the dark without running into things because we can feel our way with our feet. Um, we can sense we're at the bottom of the stairs or if you've ever had that experience of you thought you were at the bottom and there's one more step and you kind of jar because your nervous system organized your body to be able to hit the landing point and it just disappears. So that's your proprioceptive sense. Um, Dr. Martina Neerthart, she's going to be back as a guest of mine uh, in two weeks. Um, she did a fabulous lecture talking about the fascial system and how proprioceptors, the receptors that tell us where we are in space, can get hijacked and become what's called nociceptors, which record pain. So um, I found that incredibly fascinating that proprioceptors can be turned into nociceptors from where you are in space to this hurts. Because um, if you've ever had that experience of having a severe injury and you still seem to have discomfort and pain, and maybe that's because the nociceptors, the proprioceptors have become nociceptors. Um, I'm hoping that we can find someone that can elucidate that a bit more and talk more about that because I find that an incredibly interesting concept. Um, we also know that we're affecting the, well, we know we're affecting the fascial system. Um, again, Dr. Uh, Martinez lecture and uh, Sybil, Dr. Sybil Mole's lecture and many other lectures that um, the fascial system is that sort of elastic that kind of binds us. There was a really great um, little video example that was on Facebook and I reposted it where this, this guy had this kind of bodysuit on that looked kind of like a spider web, sort of a glorified thickened spider web, which is in a way what you can think of as like the fascia because it covers all the muscles and it connects everything. And then she just grabbed a hold of, of the piece of that suit and just pulled it and twisted it a little bit. And suddenly the guy couldn't raise his arm so easily because the fascial system was now pulled and not allowing him freedom of movement. So, you know, when you think about the foot and we're down at the foot level, there's, there's just the ligaments and tendons, which are also connected into the fascial system, that the deep digital flexor is connecting to the coffin bone. You've got the extensor tendons, you've got the collateral ligaments. So you've got a lot of connective tissue. Um, and connective tissue, the way I think about it is that it's everything from something really thin and soft to really thickened. So, you know, like your fascial sheets, but then when you look at your soft skeleton, your cartilage, and, um, and we tend to not think about the soft skeleton, but you know, if you've ever um, had the opportunity to do any uh, dissection, 
Um, we tend to identify bones and, oh, where's Neville? Neville's here. Um, and this is a great example in the, in the forearm. And we go, okay, there's the radius and the ulna, sorry, radius and ulna, and they're two separate bones. But what we forget about is that there's a soft skeleton, a fascial skeleton that's between these bones because that gives us a lot more surface area for muscle attachment. So in a, in a si live system, it's not just this bone A and bone B, it's this other fibers and tissues that connect those bones and create a, a larger surface area. But when we're taught anatomy, we're taught you know, ulna and radius, and we don't talk about these um, connections between the bones like these two bones, which would be um, a very significant part of the soft skeleton. So we've got soft skeleton. Um, then of course we have um, Pacinian receptors, Ruffini receptors, Merkel cells, you know, hairs. So the foot has to be able to pick up the environment. It's got to be able to register texture and register um, uneven surfaces and heat and cold and, and all kinds of things. The way your foot picks up all kinds of things to kind of give you a baseline of what you're working walking over, you know, if you're walking over something sharp, your foot will register that and you'll change course so you don't impale it in your foot. Um, so there's, it's so interconnected that sometimes that makes it difficult when we're talking about sure foot and people go, well, how does it work? <laughs> and I still get that question. Um, and I appreciate that question because we all want to know how sure foot is working, but, um, or, you know, what the system is. But the, the bottom line is we, I, I don't think there's any system you can negate. And I don't think we'll ever fully understand how it works. Um, what we do have is lots and lots of evidence based on all the horses that we've seen that are all around the world and more and more people every day um, that are seeing these same changes that I've been seeing for years. And the good news is that the veterinarians now are recognizing that this can be a really useful tool uh, for rehabilitation. And um, every day I talk to more and more vets and um, have, um, see more and more acknowledging the benefits of Surefoot, both in the rehabilitation setting, but we also want to think about it pre-injury, like to prevent injuries, um, and as a way to see more, to get more insight into, you know, why my horse moves in a certain way. Well, let's look and see how he stands on a pad, and then we can have more insight into what's going on. Um, because you, if you don't know what's going on, you can't do anything about it. Dr. Feldenkrais say, said, if you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. So if you know what you're doing, if you know that you're leaning over, you can do something about that. But how many of us sit, you know, like I love to do this when I'm teaching a riding clinic is I, I mention this concept and then I just tell everybody to look around the room and you'll see people sitting in all different ways. And then I'm like, you know, is that the most efficient way if we want to sit in balance and gravity on our horse and then everybody straightens up again. Um, but these are our habits. These are the unconscious patterns that are um, acting upon us and our horse, and our horse has unconscious patterns, and these are acting all the time. The more we can become conscious of these patterns, the more awareness we can bring in, the more we can start to see what's going on, and then the more we can do about it. But you know, if you don't notice it, if you don't know that your keys are in your hand or your sunglasses are on your head, and I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Let's look for my sunglasses. I used to use them as a hairband. Um, and I'd wander all around the house, where's my sunglasses? And suddenly I realized they're right there. And they've been there the whole time. They just weren't in my awareness. And as soon as they were, I could do what I wanted. I could put my sunglasses on or start my car. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with this uh, particular horse because this was such a dramatic change. Okay, and I thought that picture was queued up, but that's okay. I can get there. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, and I've got to do a little screen share here. Oh, photos unknown. Oh, maybe. Uh oh. Yes, open system. Oh, okay, they've made a change. I have to go to system preferences and. Uh, I'll not be able to record the contents of your screen until you quit. You can choose to, uh-oh, or do it later. Later, we're not going to quit. 
Um, that's a new message. I guess I haven't screen shared since they've updated. Um, okay, it looks like it's gonna work. Uh, I'm not sure that this is gonna be on the recording. If it's not, I'll just go and put it in afterward. Um, it wouldn't be the first time I'd had to add some images to, um, to the, power, uh, the webinar. So I'm just gonna say what the picture is so that I can time frame it and find it. Um, so this is a paint horse um, that came to me when I was in New Zealand. And um, as you can see, this horse is incredibly out of balance. And what I wanna point out is that she has a very large head. It's not just the angle of the picture. She did have a very large head. And here you can see her left front foot is propped way underneath her midline, like her point of her shoulder, if I just draw my arrow, and if you can't see my arrow, please just pop something up in the chat or the Q&A. But here's the point of her shoulder, and technically, her front leg should be on a vertical line to the point of her shoulder. So if we look at the distance from my arrow line to her hoof, we're looking at a good six, eight inches difference. And then what we can see is that her withers and her rib cage, if we draw the line of her sternum, you, it's hard to see because it's black, but if I enlarge it, there we go, you can see her sternal line is angled so that the top of the withers is way to the left. It's part of what's leaning that shoulder way over, okay? And we look at how she's, she's head up, right? And you can see how the right front foot has no weight on it. Um, we can see that her right hind leg is a little bit under her body. So hopefully that's stabilizing her a bit. And her left hind leg is not, and you can see this injury back here on her left hind leg. So I can't remember her entire story, but clearly with an injury that that severe, and it's too bad, she didn't have access to the wound treatment that Janet Varhaus talked about in my other webinar this week. But you can see how that wound is quite large and rather well along in healing. So it probably was incredibly significant. Um, but what we can see is a horse that is, is uh, in a really poor posture. And this is posture that we're looking at, that she's leaning way over, she's countering with her head, Part of the reason that this picture is kind of funky is that this horse could not stand still. She had to keep moving. Well, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because she's so out of balance. She's so leaning over her shoulder. And then if anything distracted her, she'd move her big head, which is on a thousand pound horse. The head weighs 40 pounds. The head and neck weight is a hundred pounds. It's one tenth of the body weight on a thousand pound horse. And so you take a thousand pound, oh sorry, a 40 pound head at the end of a three foot lever arm and you move it over and you have the body weight going in another direction and something's gonna move. And that's so often we talk about these horses as being disrespectful or you know not listening to us or fooling around or messing around. And this horse would have was definitely labeled in that way. But when we start to look at the way she's organizing her body, it's so obvious that she's out of balance that just telling her to quit it is not gonna solve the problem. Because just telling her to quit what? Does she even know that she stands like this? Is she even aware that she's this out of balance? Was this habit started because of that injury? And, uh, you know, I wish I could remember more of her history now. It's been about six months or so. Um, but just looking at the overall posture of this horse, it's very clear that just telling her to quit it isn't gonna solve it because she, she's obviously not aware of what's going on. And so we did a surefoot session with her, uh, and this is what she looked like afterward. And this was about uh, an hour total. Now, I had a second horse here. You can see this other horse in the background. So I did not work with this horse solely for an hour. What I did was we put her on the pads a little bit, sent her off for a walk, worked with the other horse. And so I alternated between the two horses for the hour to give them breaks because especially this horse, there's no way that she could focus and concentrate for an entire hour just on her. So I, I like to work in sort of a semi-private setting when I'm doing surefoot with horses like this, they'd come in for a session with me. And now, you know, it's not the same angle of the picture, 
but we can already see just how much, look, she's got her left hind leg a bit more underneath her. Her right hind leg is well organized. Here's the point of her buttocks, and we can see that that's actually dropping fairly straight down, right, to the cannon. Um, and if you listen to uh, Yogi Sharp's webinar the other day, he was talking about dropping a line from the point of the buttock and how it should, the cannon bone, the back of the cannon bone should follow that vertical line. Um, we can see that she's standing on her right front foot, whereas if I go back to this previous picture, and she absolutely was not standing on her right front foot. Um, and then we come here. Oh, and that's true. You can, um, if you look in the mirror at, at a distance, right? She, that's what she was doing. She was looking at herself in the mirror. Um, you can see that she's, you know, it's a little distorted because it's a mirror and it's very far away, but just look at how much overall balance we have in one hour, it's the same picture, from here to here, okay? And so, you know, for me, one of the questions is how the heck can that happen so fast? How can we take a horse that is that out of balance and pulling on the lead and falling into a horse that, okay, does it, does it mean it's gonna stick? No, this horse needs to see pads on a regular basis to make that stick but that we can see this much change is so promising. And it tells us that the possibility of change is absolutely evident in this horse. And that what she really needs more than anything is to figure out where her body is in space and to feel the ground through all four feet. Um, and I can't remember, I don't think I had her on more than a pad or two at a time. I might've done some diagonals. Um, I can, Look for a second if I stop my screen share. I know what that date is and I can just check back in my pictures. I think I have some other pictures of her. Um, so I'll just really quickly see if I can cruise back there. Uh, let's see, my photos at one point, I um, lost all the photos in my computer. And so I did that when I was in New Zealand on that trip. And so when I put them back in, um, it got a little squirrely. Uh, but I'm getting close here. Give me another moment, see if I can find the other pictures of this horse. Yeah, there's, it goes from current pictures to really non-current pictures and back and forth. Ooh, that's kind of ugly. This must be when I was fixing all this. Yeah, I can't quickly come up with them. I was hoping I could just go to the date, but unfortunately, um, there's too many under that date. That's when I started to try and resolve my problem. I don't know. Anyway, okay, but I have lots of other pictures, so no problem. I'm just going to go to my file here and, um, and pick another picture and talk about um, posture versus confirmation. And so, but that's one of the really cool things is that we can see that change in posture, which then leads to a whole different behavior. Um, and the more and more I do this, I know I've said this more than once, but it, it's so true for me that the more I work with Surefoot with horses, the more I see the difference between um, behavior and what's actually um, comes from just overall balance and lack thereof. All right, so I'm gonna go back to screen share. Okay. And um, here's a little uh, Icelandic horse. And she um, was bought by an owner who had gone out and trail ridden her and she was lovely and very nice. But this little horse had a really difficult time allowing herself to stand to be mounted. And um, if you notice here, one of the things she's done is she's put both hind feet on a firm slant. Now she did that. Um, and she look at how close together she has both of her front feet. And so when we think about even a small horse and we look at the size of this body, and if I draw the angles from one front foot down and from the other front foot, we basically got a, a V going down to a very, very small base of support. 
And so she's trying to stabilize in this super, super narrow base of support while a woman tries to get on her back. Well, if you've ever put your feet together and then tried to balance something on your shoulders, you're gonna realize that that's really difficult to do. And the solution has to be, I thought I was gonna go forward to her. Oh, yep, here's her video. Um, has to be that we have to widen out the base to feel more secure. So look, I'm gonna, oh, can I make this bigger for you? Hang on. Let's see, oh, come on. Let's hit that. Can't make it any bigger, but I'm gonna slow it down. I'll play it first in real time. Okay, and I want you to watch the saddle. And can you see how the rib cage is rotating, but this horse is not swaying? In other words, this is a very different pattern from all of the swaying that we've seen. This is where her rib cage is just rotating. Um, so I'll answer that question in a minute. But I'm gonna play this again. And this is not a common pattern. Um, this is a pattern that I see uh, uh, probably one to 2% of the time. So it's not super common, but it is something that exists. And so it's really nice to have an example to show you. And I'm just gonna drag my, there. So watch the saddle. I know it's a little dark. Let me see if I can brighten my screen. Oh yeah. Okay. So watch the saddle and see how the saddle rotated to the right, right? And she, she increased the weight on the right front foot. So I'm gonna bring it back to the beginning. I'm gonna do it again and watch. Here's the saddle rotating to the right and she unweights her left front foot. So this is rib cage rotation that we're seeing here, right? This isn't a sway in terms of a body. I've shown videos before of horses that sway and rock. And that's a whole body motion over their feet with the, the legs involved. This is much different in that the rib cage um, is moving. You can see the saddle move to the right and she unloads her left front and then it comes back, okay? And then it goes to the right again. And now if you think about someone getting on this horse with this degree of instability in the rib cage, can you understand why she would have a behavior of being difficult to mount. And so that's where I keep going back to this idea that so much of the behavior that we have termed behavioral actually has a physical component, something that we really need to address in order to make this horse not only a better citizen, but to make her feel better, be more confident, be more secure, because this imbalance is, is there. And until we have an environment where we can see it, it doesn't exist. We don't understand why is this horse difficult to get on? Why does she always move away from the bounding block? Why can't she just stand there quietly and let me get on? Because she's not stable in her rib cage. Now you have to remember, horses do not have a collarbone and they have 18 pairs of ribs and they can rotate, the rib cage can rotate either at the back or at the front. In other words, um, I'm gonna unshare for a second. So you've got your thoracic vertebrae that have dorsal processes. Neville here is not very helpful because his dorsal processes are so tiny, these little bumps, right? But these dorsal processes in a horse, the ones at the withers are 12 inches tall and they're angled back. And so you have these tall, think Golden Gate get bridge kind of support structures with guide wires, the ligaments that are connecting them. But when you line up the thoracic spine on a horse, it's actually kind of lining it up. Here's, here, we'll do it this way. If these are the different dorsal processes of several vertebrae, when you take them and line just the bones up, they'll flop. They won't stay upright. You can't make them stay upright. So they flop one way and then the other because of the design of the joints. And I wanna bring back the bone room ladies so that they can talk about what's going on in the thoracic spine and how this kind of movement can occur. So we need ligaments and tendons and muscles to stabilize the rib cage and the thoracic vertebrae to keep it stable and upright. And when that's not happening, um, either that the thoracic sling isn't, isn't strong or you know, some of the muscling between the vertebrae are not strong. Um, and I would like them to actually, um, in fact, I'm gonna 
go out and ask them for that as a topic really soon because it's really fascinating. But you can see just how much, and so she's standing on a super base narrow support, her feet very close together, and she's rotating that rib cage. And I'm just gonna kind of skirt this forward. And there you can see the rocky rock, right? Tick tock, tick tock, tick. I call it tick tock. And it's back and forth, back and forth. And so then just imagine a, an, an older woman who's a little bit on the heavy side mounting this horse. And then you can start to understand why we have a behavior problem. And so here now, um, did my screen share work and you're looking at her from nose on? Uh, I'll just stop and restart it because screen share with Zoom is always a little bit tricky and I don't want you guys to not be able to see this. Okay, so here now, look at how much wider apart she's standing in front, but she's still quite narrow behind. There's that rocky. Now you can see it from the front. You can see just how much of the rib cage is rotating. And then there's a sway in there as well, right? And look at her breathing change there, right? So now she's starting to play with this a little bit she, because we can see by her expression, we got our eye blinks, right? She turns her head and whoa, her rib cage goes back to the left, right? And then she puts her head weight over her right front and her rib cage goes to the left, but it doesn't go to the left in the way that it moves to the right. In other words, it's almost like it comes up to middle and doesn't actually rotate to the right the way it rotates left. So once again, I'm gonna take this video and I'm gonna drag it so that we can watch, right? Here her head has now moved and we look at the plane of her face and the line of it and it's, we're on a little bit of an angle, so it's not perfectly straight on, right? but we can see that she started to move her head toward her left front. And you can see this bulging of her rib cage to the right. And again, the really narrow hind feet, the front feet are a little wider apart, but still not really square under her shoulder in front. And now as I just take this very slowly, right? There's our deep eye blink, but she has shifted her rib cage, right? More, more, more as she's turning her head to the left. And so now what we can see is that there's more weight coming down on this right front. It almost looks like she's lifted up the left, not really possible in the way I describe it, but it looks, appears to have much less weight on it. Her sternal line, I wish I could zoom this in, but her sternal line is pretty straight, right? It's not like we see it on a really big angle. Here's her head turning to the left. Here's the, the center of the pummel of the saddle, aiming off to the right, right? And now as she turns her head a little more, right? We get a little ear flick, an eye blink. She starts to move her ribs and her notice that her head here is actually staying rather still, not perfectly still, but rather still. And there her rib cage is starting to come back. And then it goes, oh, I lost, there we go. And then it goes right again. And then look at the softening we saw there. So, you know, remember I started out saying you can't do what you want until you know what you do. I, I can only guess that this horse is starting to understand what she does, right? That there's a level of awareness because now we saw the deep eye blinks, She's moved her head to the right. There she rotates the rib cage right again, loads the right front, right? She spotted something, her ears went up, her rib cage is coming back. But we're not seeing the same kind of quick rock that we saw in the other video. So now I'm gonna let this play again at regular speed so that it kind of helps your eye. Okay, rib cage right, head starting left, head a little more left. Rib cage coming back a little, but still really bulging right, a little more right. Head comes middle, body comes more middle. Right, little play there. It's not this quite the same as the, it's a little more swaying instead of the rocking. Turns her head to the right, and you saw the rib cage come up, but it kind of sticks. It doesn't go all the way over. And we can still see now in this position, I'll just stop it there because we can see the saddle. And you know, so many people tell me, well, my saddle always slides off to one side. 
Um, I recently had somebody that actually emailed me and said, my saddle's always sliding off to one side. I've had my saddle checked. I've had myself checked, you know, and it's still sliding off to one side. Well, I think now what you can see is why that's possible. Because if the horse is rotating the rib cage, the saddle is going to slide. And then the minute you add rider weight, that's only going to throw the rider off. And then, you know, here we are, oops, um, putting more weight on one side of the horse. It's gonna impact the front leg. It's gonna impact the movement. It's gonna um, cause, you know, overloading, a lot, just a lot of stuff. Um, so any, any questions about that? Oh, let's get back to where I can see that you've asked questions. Let's see, uh, about the first horse, to get better posture to stick, doesn't it take time for the muscles to adjust? So um, yes and no. Uh, and that's the thing that I find so fascinating that, all right, in order for it to hold in all circumstances, we need experiences um, of, the, of that feeling. But what is so fascinating with horses is that once you give them the possibility, they're so quick to adopt it, um, much quicker than people. You know, people have excuses. Oh, I have an excuse. You know, I, I can't go riding first thing in the morning because I've got to get up and, you know, get on the computer and answer email. Oh, I can't go riding first thing in the morning because, you know, instead of just getting up and riding first thing in the morning and then feeling good about it and doing the rest of my day. Um, but horses don't have that capacity. If it feels better to them, they're going to embrace it. And Yes, the muscles will need to strengthen, but it's the brain that has to make the change. Um, the brain has to know that there's another opportunity, another possibility. And I've seen horses where you turn them back out in the field and they go and they experiment and they play with their body posture and they, you know, check it out and they move around and um, they go out and canter and check out, you know, what that's like. And um, so, yeah, but they they have to have the opportunity to feel something different before they can even begin to make, oh, this is a really interesting horse. Um, so, let me share my screen. Um, this was a horse um, that just, he was really uncomfortable. And we started with the half physio pad. And you can see, like, I'm trying a video and he clearly didn't stay on that pad very long. Um, I just got back enough to kind of get a picture of him, right? And I'm not sure where we are in the process at this point. But, um, you know, here, here's a horse that he's not even on the pad anymore and he's licking and chewing and yawning. Um, and he was an older guy, really sweet horse, um, but definitely had some, some physical issues. And again, I wish I, I, my problem is that I see so many horses, it's hard for me to remember all the stories. This was actually a couple of years ago. Um, but they don't have to be on the pads to be making changes. And so, so, you know, that goes back to the duration is that a lot of people think they have to stay on the pads for a long time to have a big effect. And you're, you're much better off with small doses, letting them have an interval of rest in between offering a pad again, and keeping your session short in the beginning so that you can let them kind of start to figure out what's going on, what's happening. Um, so, you know, this horse is only on one pad, right? And um, she's an older halflinger. And we can see, so here's just, let's see if I can make my screen bigger again. Right, so some of the changes that we see, and that's what I wanna point out in this video, is, you know, how do we know that's having an effect? Well, she looks back, okay? And then we're gonna watch the eyes. We get the blinky eyes, that's very typical. And then they get really soft and then they shut, right? And it's not unusual to see these horses just close their eyes. Um, then you can see, I'll just take that back, okay? So she looks around. And this is one of the things you can do, you know, if you, if you work with a horse and you're not sure, because there's a lot that you're doing when you're, you're placing pads and things, it's really hard to video and take photos and do the pads. But so 
you know, if you have somebody that can just do a little video for you, and then you can go back later and look at it and to see what's going on. So here now we can see that we've got this really soft eye. And this is just from one pad. I'm pretty sure if I have it right, this horse had had chronic laminitis. And so we were just offering some comfort. And again, just notice how that eye really closes. And then there's this, watch this little body movement here. She has her head to the right, right? And her neck is curved to the left. It's concave on the right. And she starts to move her head. And as she moves her head, you can see that little shift in her neck right there. And you, just look at this shadow right here. So you'll see a change in the shadow. And in fact, you may even be able to see her pulse. I'll have to play this in real time. But right there, there's a little tiny bit of movement and that could actually be her pulse, right? And we see the head move, right? And then these little tiny movements in the head and neck. And we've had conversations with Sharon Wilsey about that, about kind of like a, a bit of a reset. So I'm just gonna play this in real time now. And just think about that little spot that we saw there at the base of the neck. Yep. And now you can see her pulse right there, right? So that's one of the things that when they start to really soften the neck, you'll be able to start to see the pulse in the jugular vein. I'll just play that one more time. And so if you ever have difficulty taking your horse's pulse, just put them on a sure foot pad and their neck will soften and you'll be able to take their pulse just counting, just watching so you can see it pulsing there. Right? So one of the reasons I point this out is it's a good thing to observe that pulse and that breathing, that respiration, to make sure that we're not push, you know, taking the system too far. Let's see. I used the full physio with my mayor. She's similar to the chestnut you showed, stays on for a few seconds, maybe a minute. Not really sure what I'm doing with it. <laughs> yeah. And she has some issues with bulging the left canter and just not really having great balance. She also bites her chest, hoping the pad will have some kind of effect. I'm trying to be observant. This is great. And Allie, that's, um, I'm not sure how long you've been working with the physiopad with your mayor. Um, some of the horses, it's, and let's see if I, I think I have more video of this. Yeah, here he is. Um, this is, that's not a long video. Let's see if I have something. Here's 19 seconds. Um, you know, sometimes it only takes a second or two on the pad. And uh, with some horses, it's actually, I don't wanna use the word overwhelming, but it's more information than they can really process in a moment. Um, if, if you've had a very long standing habit and that you had just, that had become how you saw yourself, that this is just the way I am. And then someone comes along and says, hey, you can be different. The first thing you're gonna to tell, do is tell them that you can't right? This is who I am. I've been this way for a really long time. Uh, you know, I've learned to accept it. I just live with it. Um, you know, I hear these stories all the time. Because when we lose the idea that we can change, then we just kind of come, become resigned to the fact that this is the way it is. It's just going to be this way. Um, and I think horses have that same thing, that they just resign to the fact that this is their lot in life. This is the way it is. There's really not a possibility of change. Um, and so um, when you're working with your mare, if she just walks off, you know, just allow her to walk off. And I would suggest that you just go to another foot. And I'm really glad that you're just working with the physio pad because I think a two inch pad would probably be too much for your horse if she's having difficulty with that. You might try flipping it over to the gray side, the medium side, right? And I'm just gonna play this video here with this horse and we can see now that he's able to stay longer on this pad, but he really did not stay very long at all in the beginning. And what we can also see is that this really is his supporting leg. Like you can see how he really doesn't have a lot of weight on his left front, and I'll just play that again. So sometimes, and in this case he was able to stay there, but sometimes we pick the leg that's actually the leg that's holding everything up. So, you know, when I had my surgery, my right leg was holding everything up. And if somebody came along and said, oh, we're gonna take your right leg and take it out from underneath you and put it on something squishy, I would feel very uncomfortable because 
that's my supporting leg. I need that leg. It's the one I'm relying on right now. Yeah, I'm overtaxing it. And yeah, it gets really, really tired. And without it, I don't know that I can stand. And so sometimes we just have to look. And in this case, like what you can see is that this column, this leg column is very clear and to the ground, very vertical and clear to the ground. And to me, it, and I can't, again, this was two years ago, um, but you can see that he, it appears that he's really sort of standing on this leg and that he's not really standing on this left front and he's not standing on his right hind, it's out behind him and he's kind of standing on his right hind. But, you know, just looking at the angle of the stifle and the way the leg is standing, to me, it looks like he's basically got, you know, a primary amount of his weight. This is his supporting leg and this is the one he's standing on. And so now as I take this forward slowly, look, we can see, look at all the muscle twitching in that shoulder. And I'll just do that a couple times, right? And again, this isn't something that we picked up when I went at speed, right? But here you can see there's a little movement in the tail. So there's a bit of a breeze. We don't see any flies around, but we see that really strong muscle twitch in that shoulder. And look at the um, simultaneous closing of his eye. So as that area twitches, there's eyes closed, there's the muscle, right, twitching, then he opens his eye a little bit, turns his head a little bit, right, his eye is completely closed, there he's licking, there's a little tail swish, Sharon would talk about that as kind of completing a thought, right, there his eyes are closed again, right, and look at this deep blinking that we see right here with um, a little bit of a head nod. So it's tiny, it's not very big, right? Little bit of a head nod going with the blinky eyes, looks over because he probably hears something. There's other horses coming into the arena. Yep, looks over and watch as he turns his head, it becomes even more clear that he's standing on this right front foot, right? And there's more muscle twitching, look at that. And look at how, <laughs> Oh, um, I haven't played this video this way before, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm with you guys here watching this together. But watch the muscle twitching right there, and then the, sort of a level of contraction, right, that happened. And I'm going to go backwards, and I'm just going to scrub the video backwards, and you can see how much activation there is in those muscles, the eye blinks, and then I'm just going to play it in real time. So that now that your eye is trained a little bit, you go, oh, wait a second, there was a muscle twitch, but in real time, it was kind of quick, right? And there's a little lick and chew, a little head nod. So we tend to focus a lot on the face because it's so obvious, the breathing changes, the licking and chewing, the eyes closing, the head lowering. But in this case, you can see that when we really slow this down or play it backwards there, we see, wow, and that's a lot of muscles being involved in that shoulder twitch that we see there. Um, let's see what we have on this one. So patience is one of the things that Surefoot teaches you. Um, you know, I can never predict how a horse is going to respond until I'm there with the pads working with the horse. Um, I have a lot of experience, so I'll have people come to me and go, you know, well, I'm, my horse won't stay on a pad. And um, and so I walk up with a pad and the next thing the horse is standing on two pads and they're like, well, he won't do that for me. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think it's true of my horses with me is that it's much easier for me to work with someone else's horse where I have no emotional connection and no expectations. Um, but when we work with our own horses, and I've experienced this as well, we have a certain level of uh, um, investment in our horse responding in a certain way and when they don't respond in the expected sort of managing our expectations if they don't respond in the way that we expect them having watched all these other horses then we're like um, you know we get into a lot of self-talk that really is not productive right and look at the difference in his face here by the way just um the changes if i take if i go back right and even though he's yawning in this picture you know, if you look at the face here, okay, and yeah, we get some yawning, but there's a level of tension that you can see in that face that when we get here, 
look at how much softer this all is. And, um, and I worked with him for a couple of days. Um, and here we are yawning again. Right, and now we have it under the left front. I'm gonna just come out of screen share here, see if I can find, oh yeah, here's the other pictures of him. So I'll just uh, stop screen share and I'll just restart it. So this was a four day clinic. And now you can see that um, he's on the full physio pad in front with the hard pads behind. And I pretty much just stuck with the hard, hardened physio pad with this horse, okay? But we can just see that there's a softness that's starting to come in. And there he would step off the pads a lot and do a lot of processing off the pads. And so, you know, the, the, the lesson doesn't stop when they're not on pads. The lesson continues, and it can continue for a long time. I've actually <laughs> love, uh, seen um, horses that processed for hours afterward, days afterward, um, this must be the next day. Hang on, let me just check and see what I've got here. So I'll just go back to screen share here. Um, and I've seen horses where, you know, that, um, and Bob, we got an update on Bob, those of you who have um, um, Followed Bob's story. Bob was the thoroughbred off the track up in Canada at Robin Hood's place, Icelandic horse farm. Um, and we just got another report about Bob where Robin was using him for another video and um, they put him on the pads again and he, he made another change. And the owner has reported that really the defining moment was when we did the Surefoot sessions with that horse over, um, I think it was three sessions over four days that really just turned the, turned the corner, right? Um, so these are just still shots that I have of him. Maybe I'll have, nope, that's another horse. Okay, but just that there's so much more softness. And yeah, is he still standing in the pattern that we saw before with the left front sort of unloaded, the right front on the pad? And absolutely. So, you know, it's really hard to say how many sessions or how long it's going to take for a horse to make permanent change. It's the same for you. Um, you know, depending on the degree of injury or insult, the emotional environment associated with it, the how early it was in development, like if something happened like when the horse was young versus an older horse that just had a little a bit of a recent insult, all these factors go into how long it's going to take for the horse to make a permanent change. And I, you know, I can never say how long it's going to take because of all these factors. Um, and I think for the most part, we'd really love to have some uh, definitive answers to those questions and they don't exist. It really has to be what you discover working with your horse, um, watching your horse, knowing your horse, you'll see changes. Um, and, you know, it's a good idea to, to keep a little record of what you're seeing and when you're seeing it. Oh yeah, here's a good one. Okay. Um, and just kind of tracking it a little bit. You don't have to do really in-depth notes, but just tracking it a little bit so that you can see the progress because sometimes we're so close to the horses, we're so close to the issue or whatever it is that we, um, we can't see the progress. I'm just gonna grab a drink. All right, so now we have a, a face on shot. I'm gonna play it in real time, okay. I'm not going to say anything, I'm just let you watch for a moment. Okay, and so this horse is at this point standing on four firm pads, right? And again, I don't even, I can't tell you where this video is or when I, I'm not even sure that I filmed this. It might be something that someone sent to me. Okay, and now we're going to watch this in slow motion. So I'm just going to slowly. So here's the first thing to notice that we have the head way to the left. Okay. But we also can see that the sternal line right here is quite straight, actually. Um, and there looks to be a fairly even weight distribution given that the head is over. So, oh, I know where this, this is in Germany. Um, this is a video somebody sent to me. And we can see how there's a curve to the neck, 
the rib cage looks pretty upright, the weight looks fairly even. The thing that first stands out to me is we see a sway, and it's like a lateral sway. So horses can sway in different ways. They can sway laterally, just like a boat side to side. They can sway front to back with the rear end going one way and the front end the other. They can do that really quick movement that we saw with the little Icelandic. Um, and so what you often see a particular sway pattern in a horse, and I think of it as sort of the primary pattern. You'll see a particular way that a horse sways. And then you may see a secondary pattern, like if they sway like a boat, then you might see them swaying end to end. And rarely, but on occasion, you can see a third sway pattern show up. Now, that third sway pattern, you might only see once, maybe twice in the whole session. Um, the secondary pattern, you might see increasing. Um, and then the primary pattern, if you see a secondary pattern increasing, you'll see the primary pattern kind of decreasing. Or you might just see that they have a primary pattern, it's consistent all the time, it doesn't vary, it's the same every time you put them on the pads. And those are just things to um, observe, note, you know, write down in your notepad, but to not necessarily, um, I don't build stories around them, I just observe them. Uh, no one has thoroughly explained to me the sway patterns. Um, I talked to Dr. Hillary Creighton years ago and she said this is not postural sway. So what is postural sway? If you were to be standing and close your eyes, you would, uh, and tune in a little bit, you would feel that your body is making a very small sway pattern. And we all make a very small sway pattern. Um, and then, you know, you can have the discussion, is that sway pattern symmetrical, asymmetrical? Is it a healthy pattern? Whatever, we're not gonna go there. But there is this postural sway. What we see with the horses is too big for postural sway. So, um, it's probably something else, but we really don't know whether it's the horse exploring, which I think in some cases I'll watch a horse and I'll go, oh, he's, mess he's messing around. He's really checking something out. Or if it's unconscious or if it's, um, you know, something that is just starting to show them something. I mean, it's really, really hard to say. Um, you know, I can't even say with, a, with, with one of you why you do what you do. Um, half the time we don't even know. So, all right, so the head is coming more straight. There's obviously other horses in the arena. And now we can see from here, watch the chest to here, the weight has shifted from right front and you can see the bulge in the rib cage on the right. And you can see that we have weight on the right front to left. And then watch because there's this little something that happens in the back end that's not so easy to see. The weight switches to the right front and then see that little movement in the rear end and it's almost like a little rotational shift back to that left hind, right? The head is still over the left front, okay? The nostrils are rather flared, you know, but there's eye blinks and it could be a hot day. There's a the horse has a fair amount of coat. So we do notice that the nostrils are a bit, a bit hard and opened, but the eye blinks ears go back. Now look at that little head tilt right in there, right? So the ears go back and then watch. You see how right here, if you look at the jawline to the throat, you'll see that like it's like there's a little bit of a twist with a little bit of extension right there, right there, right? And that could be part of this breathing pattern because there's it's a little bit panty. And then we still see that breathing being a little on the heavy side, right? The rib cage is a little to the right. There's our eye blinks. Now our head starts to come straight. But what's interesting is from the pole to the nose, the head's on a slight angle. And here's the point of the shoulder, right? And the leg looks a little medial to the point of the shoulder, meaning to the inside from the point of the shoulder. And the neck isn't curving to the right. It's, it's a little bit angular, right? And then we go back and we go way to the right and we can see this whole right side getting longer and we could guess that the left side's getting shorter. So from this, could you guess which way this horse is gonna bend easier? And he just showed us, right? And you can see as the head comes around, even though the sternum is fairly straight, 
we see this bulge of the rib cage here and we can see how there's more load on that right front. So everything's kind of gone to the right and convex on the right, concave on the left. Um, and so it was a, it's a pretty easy guess that this horse is gonna bend to the left a lot easier than to the right. So now I'll just play it in real time again. Right. You can see that the breathing is, is pretty panty right there. You can see some nostril flare, but the horse isn't what I would call stressed, just breathing a little heavy, right? Eye blinks, ears, you know, ears forward, but the rib cage is pretty much over to the right. Even when the head starts to come to the right, we don't see the rib cage move left. And then of course we see it go way to the right, rib cage bulging, right? And then very clearly right there. Okay, questions about that? I don't see any questions. Okay, I must be doing a good job if there's no questions. Um, here's a horse, and I'll just stop and reshare. Just always want to make sure that you're actually seeing what I'm seeing. So now we're looking at a horse from behind and under the weight of a rider. Okay, and here's our tail head, and here we can see, you know, it, that all looks fairly straight. You always have to question whether the videographer is standing really square behind a horse when we're doing this. I'm just going to play it in real time first. And when you have a rider on board, um, that always, it's kind of like the mast on a ship. And so anything that's happening under the water is uh, exaggerated at the top of the mast. So if you're having difficulty seeing what's going on with a horse, just watch the rider if they're under saddle because then things get bigger or, you know, the, the longer the radius of the circle, the more obvious things become. And she's doing her best to sit really, really quietly. Um, and that's not always easy to do when you're on a horse when they start to sway. I often talk about it feeling like you're on a, on a, a boat or it's like a drunken spider. Okay, so now we're gonna watch this in slow motion. I'm just gonna take my pointer and drag it. Right, okay, so we can see things look higher on the right here. If we look at her belt line, we can see that it's a little angled from right to left, high to low. Um, when we look at her feet, that doesn't seem as obvious. So what can we use for landmarks? Um, I tend to like to look at the bottom of the rider's feet and see if they're level, because other things, factors can be happening above, but if we look at the feet, that gives us a pretty good idea if if as long as the stirrups have been measured even, and then when we look at the feet, the stirrup length is the same. We're, if we see changes, then we're seeing something happening in the rib cage, right? So here we can see we're going from right to left, and look at how this line here has just changed. So I'll take it back. Here you can see that it's straighter, and now the tail line starts to curve, so that the tail's going to the right, Ribs are going to the left. Yep, and she's, you can see her hand, she just reported that feeling. And then comes back, little tail swish, we can see an ear, right? And then you see here, the rear end kind of swings to the side. So instead of a sort of a rolling motion, it's an end-to-end -end motion. So if you watch right here, you'll see how the rear end swings to the left, and then the front end shifts, right? Little tail swish, and then we roll to the right a little bit. Little tail swish. And the rider is talking to me at this point, so, right? And then we see that roll to the left again, but then there's a little, look at that difference there, right? And now the rear end swings to the right. So, um, oh, is it really two o'clock already? Where did the time go? <laughs> that was like, Really fast. Um, so let's just look at, we'll look at one more. Let me find one more that we can talk about. Uh, there's something, I've got a little bit of a video. Hang on, I'm gonna find a little bit of video here. Oh, I don't have that file. Um, let me just check this one out really quick and see if it's something interesting. 
Oh yeah. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to escape out of that. Go back to screen share. Back with mirror frame horizon. Oh yeah. Um, so has anybody got any questions while I'm going to this screen? You're also quietly um, attentive today. <laughs> All right. Um, this horse, if I recall correctly, um, thoroughbred off the track and anxious, nervous horse. Um, again, you can see that we're up to four pads, but the reason that I can get video when we're up to four pads is that the horses are quiet enough and then I can actually step back and take some video. When we're, you know, when I'm working with one pad and especially in the beginning with horses, they're moving off. So I might not be able to get a video because they've walked off or, you know, I'm just watching them and, they, and I ask them to walk off. Um, oh, I, okay, Al, you've been using your physio pad for five weeks and uh, at what point, you? I would say um, your horse understands being on the pad as long as you have an assistant. Um, and that's kind of the key is somebody that will listen to you and do what you ask when they um, try it under saddle, that just do one foot and just see, you know, watch the reaction when you approach with the pad. I'm sure by this point, the horse understands it. And there are times when um, a horse uh, unmounted doesn't stand but a horse when they has the rider on can stand and stand on the pad for a little while. And I, you know, again, that seems counterintuitive, um, but I have seen that. I've seen the reverse too. So um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is if you adhere to the basic rules that, you know, if you see the horse get anxious or nervous, you slow down or stop or back up, um, just allow the horse to walk off the pad. Don't ask them to stay there long. Don't try to hold on to them and um, just see how she responds. All right, so I'm gonna play this one in slow motion. I'm just gonna drag it, okay? We see a little mouth movement. And we see the head going from right. And as there's the mouth movement, and as we come left, watch how much the rider changes, right? So you see this big swing from left to right for the rider, okay? And you can see how the horse has her head over this right front foot, but also notice the angle of the right front foot. It's a little bit wider, it's a little bit forward. And so she's got her head organized over that right front foot. And we can see that she's actually kind of narrow in the chest here, that she's actually standing almost a little wider than her shoulder points, right? Which would increase her stability to stand a little wider as opposed to the um, Icelandic that stood narrower. And now as the head's coming to the left, you can see, yeah, she's got the weight leaning on the right front and then she hears something and she comes back and then switches her weight to the left, but not in the same way as to the right. Can I please explain the pads again? Um, Carolyn, are you meaning the purpose of the pads? We've had a lot of videos and I've done a lot of intro videos um, in lieu of time. Um, Carolyn, I suggest that you go back and watch the intro to the Surefoot Equine Stability Program. Uh, webinar that I did uh, about two months ago, actually. Um, the whole point is to bring awareness, and that's what it does. And the horses find better balance, stability. Um, it's an offer, it's not a demand. You allow the horses to walk off anytime. You start with one foot. Um, you keep your hands away from the foot when you position the pad, but the whole point of it is awareness to bring awareness to the horse to how they're standing and how they're meeting the ground, because no matter the size of the horse, all they get are those four little feet. And so in this horse's case, you can imagine that if she's standing like this with her body weight going to the right and leaning on her right front, that if you asked her for a left lead canter to part, she'd probably want to pick up her right lead or fall to the right or have difficulty turning left. And so in this discussion, we're really looking at what can we glean from looking at horses on pads and how can we improve our eye to be able to see what's going on that helps us understand the experiences that we have with our horses. Um, so often we label them behavior problems when really what we're looking at are balance problems, but we don't see them. We don't see the balance problem. We just simply see the behavior problem. You know, my horse chucks its head in the air when I ask it for a canter to part, or my horse leans on the shoulder, or my horse, you know, falls forward, or my horse is heavy on the forehand. Um, all of these things can be explained 
when we start to understand the pattern of the horse and its habits and the way it's, uh, and the pads help us to actually see that. So if I just kind of drag this forward a little bit more, we can see when she turns her head to the right that she comes a little more into her left front, but she doesn't have that same, here we go, right? Here's head to the right. And we can see that basically she's standing over that left front foot pretty squarely and her ribs have not gone very far over. And then as she turns her head to the left, watch the rib cage, watch the balance shift and the lean, right? And so when we see this kind of pattern where she's very clearly uh, drops on the right side like that, that it can explain a lot of the problems that we have riding under saddle. Um, is the horse lifting the heels on the pad, both with front feet and hind feet? Should I, hang on, hang on, let me just finish this thought and then we'll go to your question, Kristen. So, you know, so often when I work with riders, they're like, well, my horse just doesn't like to pick up the right lead. Well, it's not about my horse doesn't want to pick up the right lead. It's about what's preventing your horse from picking up the right lead that we didn't discover. Um, and the more we can discover that, then the better it is for everybody. Um, uh, somebody's just asked if we have a UK reseller. We are just bringing on a UK reseller. Her name is Becky Ferry. And if you email me or contact her through Facebook, we'll get you hooked up. Um, and yes, we're, we, cause we are looking for resellers. Um, so, um, we can hook you up with Becky. That'd be awesome. And then someone's asked, uh, if a horse is lifting the heels on the pad, both with front and hind feet, should I try a slant pad? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been using the hard flat pad with a half physio since the beginning of May. The horse would like more time on the pad, but I have stuck to a half a minute. At this point, if you've been working for a month, you can increase the duration. Okay, so it's really that beginning that we have to be careful of time. And now that you know how your horse is going to respond, absolutely, you can increase duration. Um, the horse does have Cushing's and laminitis, and it prefers the soft side of the physio pad and tries to walk on the grass when I lead it up the driveway. Yeah, so um, absolutely. I think a firm slant would probably be the recommendation I would have there because it's going to have be softer than the hard slant, and um, that would probably be my next choice. So you can give that a go. Uh, looks like I got a couple more questions. I answered that one live. Great. Okay, super. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to run too over. All my webinars have run over this week, and I know everybody's trying to watch them, but, you know, if we go too long. Um, I do this webinar where we just talk about Surefoot and take questions every Friday. So join me again next Friday. And, of course, all of the webinars are available on my Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. You can go there and find all of them. They're listed under webinars, and we've been numbering them. And also, um, if you ever, if you don't get my email, that lists all the webinars for the week. Um, you can go to murdochmethod.com and sign up for the email. I send it out every weekend with a link to all of the webinars for the week that you can sign up. And if you're not on the mailing list, you can go to the Surefoot Equine uh, website and go to the calendar because I post all the webinars there and I have a direct link to sign up to register for the webinars on the calendar. So thanks everybody for joining me. This is like amazing how fast this hour has gone by. Um, it's really fun. To, to show you some of these videos and to really start getting into some of the nitty gritty details of what we see using Surefoot pads. And again, if you've kind of missed the beginning of the story, just go back and, and um, there's, lot, there's quick start guides and there's short clips of talking about, you know, how to choose the right pad and why use Surefoot and, um, and great. Thanks everybody. I'm glad you're enjoying the webinars. Um, I've got a great lineup of guests for next week. Uh, Sharon Wilsey is going to be back with me. So um, that's always fun. We always have a great time and uh, I'll be posting that email um, this weekend. So thanks again and have a great weekend and always remember to enjoy the ride. Bye.